Hey YouTube, it's ICU. Today we're going to be reviewing the all new fourth generation Apple TV. It's been out for just over a week. I've had it for about a month and I felt like sharing my thoughts and opinions on it with you guys. <laughs> All right, so getting started here, if you guys want a chance to win a brand new fourth gen Apple TV of your own, just be sure to rate this video up and stick around to the end for complete instructions. And with that said, let's start at the beginning. So the fourth gen Apple TV comes in two different flavors, 32 and 64 gigabytes, starting at $149 for the base model or $199 for the 64 gig configuration. From there, what comes inside of the box is just the Apple TV unit itself, the remote for the device, which has been completely reworked the power cable, as well as a lightning to USB cable to actually charge the remote. For everything that comes in the box, as well as the complete unboxing experience, just be sure to check out my video covering it. I will have it linked for you guys directly in the cards right now if you're on the desktop version of YouTube, as well as down below in the more info. As far as setting it up goes, you have two different flavors. You have manually or automatically with your iOS device. So for manually, all you have to do is just input the password for your Wi-Fi network using the touch remote. And then from there, you have to to put in your Apple ID as well as your Apple ID password. So it's a little bit more tedious. If you wanna do the automatic way, you just have to have an iOS device on 9.1 or higher but not the iPad 2, that's not supported. And then just make sure Bluetooth is enabled, unlock it near the Apple TV, and then it will automatically prompt you to set it up. All you're going to have to do is just input your password for your Apple ID, and it should automatically connect to your Wi-Fi network and sign in to your Apple ID, and then you'll be pretty much good to go. You'll just have a few other basic setup options, but you don't have to input any sort of credentials after that point. And for the complete setup, just be sure to check out my aforementioned unboxing video. And as for the device itself, it's pretty much identical to its predecessor. It has the exact same design. It has the same footprint. The only thing that's different is actually the height of the device. As well as on the back, we no longer have optical audio, and we also have the revision of USB-C over micro USB now. So you will need a USB-C to USB cable to actually plug in to your computer if you want to do restores. But for most customers, the automatic OTA updates will suffice. That's why Apple doesn't include the USB to USB-C cable inside of the packaging. And as for optical audio, I don't really find it to be a problem. As you can see, I do have a Sonos play bar there down below at the bottom of my setup, and I just connect to it through optical audio from the Sonos bar to the actual TV itself. Apple figures that you're going to send the audio sound over HDMI, and then the TV can handle it from there. So optical audio out to whatever is actually going to be playing the sound. So I found, at least in my case, that that works perfectly fine. And now before we get into the menu and interface, let's actually talk about the remote. So it is definitely different than the one that comes shipped with its predecessor or even the second generation Apple TV, which I have over here on the left, just the basic aluminum remote, which connects via IR. This one actually connects through Bluetooth, so you don't have to point it at the actual Apple TV set-top box unless you want to. You can, but remember, you can point it anywhere and it will still function just fine. All of the buttons will work. It also does have an IR blaster toward the top there, but that's actually just for control the sound on your TV or on your sound bar. In this case, we have Sonos and it works just fine for that. Let's actually go over the physical buttons on it now. So toward the top, we have this trackpad basically. It is completely glass. We have more of a matte finish on the top and it is receptive to touch input. So in order to navigate through the menus, all you have to do is just swipe around. It's very simple and it does actually click in. So it is a physical button. That's how you're actually going to make the selections on the Apple TV interface is by hitting in on this top trackpad there. And what I actually did because I took the TV off screen for a second was I went all the way back to the home screen after tapping into an icon with the trackpad. So this button down below here on the right will actually always return you to the home screen of your Apple TV. Whereas on the left we have menu, that's basically the back button. So if you're inside of movies for instance and you go to one specific movie, you can press menu and it will take you back one step. You can also of course hold it and it will take you all the way back just like it would on the old remote. However, the best way to do it is just by using this main TV button there over on the right hand side. Now beneath menu, we have the Siri button. You just hold it and what that will do is it will activate Siri. As you can see, we do have a microphone there on the top and we also have a secondary one on the back. And then 
below that, we have pause play, pretty self-explanatory. And then to the right, we do have volume rocker controls, which you can actually set up the sound inside of the settings app. So whether you want it to control your TV via IR, automatically over HDMI, or your sound bar, really it gives you tons of options to set up. We're going to get into all of that in just a second. Overall, I really do like the construction of this. The touchpad is flawless. I haven't really noticed any sort of anomalies with it whatsoever. And toward the bottom, it is kind of this glossy glass. You can see it definitely does pick up fingerprints easily. However, it doesn't scratch easily, which I really do like. And on the back, it's just some aluminum construction. Very nice. Toward the bottom, we have one last thing, the actual lightning connector. So this is how you're going to charge it. Apple claims that you get about three months of usage on a single charge. And again, I have had the Apple TV fourth gen for a little over a month now, and it's still at about 66% charge. So that definitely does back up their claim of three months of battery life on this remote here. I so far am loving it. And in order to charge it, all you have to do again is just connect the lightning cable that it comes with or any other lightning cable that you have for that matter into the bottom of it. You can then connect the other end into your computer or just into the wall adapter that comes shipped with the iPhone, for example, and it will charge it that way. So overall, I'd say the remote is a huge win for the new fourth gen Apple TV. Huge thumbs up to that. Apple did a great job in designing it and actually getting the software to work in synchronous with it perfectly. And this is actually a great time to demonstrate the pre-sleep cycle that we have here on this fourth gen Apple TV. So if you're just hanging out inside of the menu and you kind of set the remote down for a little bit and then you go to pick it up which I'm doing right now it will actually pop back into view so with it in kind of that dormant state it will just focus on whatever's selected and kind of darken everything around it but when you actually go to pick that up then everything kind of snaps back into place like I was talking about that's actually before it will go to sleep and how it's able to do that is with the gyroscope sensors inside of the remote so that's another great thing developers can actually make use of the sensors in this remote to kind of make games similar to the Wii in the sense that you can actually move the remote around to interact with games. So for example, inside of Asphalt 8, you actually tilt the remote this way and you use it back and forth to steer the car inside of that game. Again, other developers can make use of it. And I've actually seen one game that I've played through and you actually tilt it back and forth this way to interact with the Manicore Rising app. So developers can do some pretty great stuff with the gyroscope in this remote. And I've found that it's very accurate, but we're starting to get ahead of ourselves. Let's actually go through the menu as well as the interface here. You'll notice that it's very similar and very familiar to what we see on the third generation Apple TV, but updated. Things actually do look flatter, kind of more glossy, as well as a more frosted appearance. So bringing the remote into view here, you'll notice that when we do swipe over on the top touchpad area, it does correlate to a swipe or a move inside of the UI or the interface. I found that it's a really superb way to navigate and it's so much better than the old school method with the third gen or the second generation Apple TV where you had to actually arrow over. So again, it is so much better and it's much more accurate. And you may have also noticed that when we do swipe over, the top section changes. So we do have a carousel at the top that's very similar to what we had on the third generation Apple TV. It is dynamic based on the applications that you have at the top. However, only the stock apps are actually able to bring back certain elements from within inside of the application without actually having having to jump into the app and navigate to that specific segment. So what I mean by that is when we're on movies, for example, we do have purchased over on the left hand side and we have top movies on the right. We can actually go up and then scroll over through them. And you'll notice here we are navigating through the top movies. We can jump to the specific listing. So let's say we want to go inside of Jurassic World. All we have to do is have it highlighted and then click into it just using the top touchpad there. And then it will automatically go to the Jurassic Jurassic World movie listing inside of the iTunes portion of movies there. So let's go ahead and exit out now. And you'll notice that when we're over the app store, we kind of have a similar effect. So we do have some sections here that are predefined by Apple. You'll notice that we have some other applications advertised such as Netflix, HBO Now, etc. And when we continue to swipe, we get more options there. And when we go down and over to music, same thing. We have our recently added music 
at the top based on album. And swiping down and then over, we do have something kind of similar for photos. The album isn't populating right now, but we definitely can see that for TV shows there. And what's interesting is that inside of the purchase section, it will actually show sample content that you've downloaded. So I downloaded this for the sole purpose of this video. But as you can see, we still do have purchased over on the left hand side. And we also have top TV shows if we continue to scroll there. So let's go ahead and scroll scroll back down and I'm going to show you guys what happens when we add a third party app toward the top. So one that wasn't developed by Apple. Let's go ahead and do it with Oceanhorn. So as I mentioned, third party applications cannot have that interactive carousel toward the top if it's one of the top row applications. Hopefully Apple will add a new API in the future to allow developers to kind of build that into it because it's so convenient to just instantly see at a glance some portions of a specific app. Like for Plex, for example, it would be extremely useful. And even if it is an application that does have that kind of carousel effect when it's highlighted in the top row, if it's not in the top row, you will no longer see that effect. So as you can see, we're on TV shows now and it still shows as movies. What might be a better example is to go over to apps and then swipe down and then over to TV shows. As you can see, that top section is no longer affected. It only is influenced by that top row there. All right, so let's go ahead and move on now and actually jump inside of the movies application. And I'm going to give you guys an awesome rundown. So toward the top there, you'll notice we do have kind of this gray bar that is consistent across pretty much all applications, including most third party apps, unless they're games, sometimes they won't have them. But essentially that's kind of the main menu of an application toward the top. We have purchased on the far left, top movies, and then genres recommended as well as search. So let's go ahead and go to search for for example, and you'll notice that when I swipe down to actually make my search, that menu goes away. We can then re-access it simply by swiping up on the touchpad there, or you can press menu. So there are two different ways to access it, and then you can actually jump to another section with inside the application itself. It's very simple, and it's so convenient to actually access all of the different sections that way. It just makes the experience that much more fluid. So let's go ahead and go to top movies, and then swipe down to drive Jurassic World there. I'm going to show you guys what we actually see when we're inside of a movie listing for iTunes. So in the background, we do have some great artwork. We also have the stylized title there. Again, that does change based on whichever movie you're actually browsing through. And then beneath that, it gives you the Rotten Tomatoes score, the kind of sensible rating, which is how old they think you actually should be before watching this video, the runtime of it, genre, its release year, as well as the actual rating of it, in this case, PG-13 whether it includes closed captions or not, as well as the resolution, in this case HD, 1080p. And this might be a good time to mention that currently the fourth gen Apple TV is only 1080p. I don't really find it to be that big of a deal. I actually use it on a 4K TV and it does upscale what you're actually browsing again to 4K. Almost all 4K TVs will upscale, though it isn't true source 4K content. It really doesn't matter. I mean, people will tell you 4K content definitely looks better. And while it does, if you're viewing your TV at an average viewing distance, you won't really be able to distinguish the difference between 1080p and 4K anyway. It goes back to what Steve Jobs said with retina displays. You won't be able to distinguish individual pixels at an average viewing distance. The same thing that applied for the iPhone 4 way back when, when it was first introduced with the original retina display still applies with TVs. In this case, we're talking about the fourth gen Apple TV set top box and any TV it's connected to for that matter. So without getting off topic here to the left, we have the director as well as who it's starring. And then kind of in the middle and beneath the title, we do have a synopsis that we can kind of read through. And if we want more information on it, we can just tap into it using the touchpad. And then beneath that we have preview buttons as well as one for buying it, renting it, and adding it to our wish list. So if we wanted to, we could just tap into it to add it to our wish list, and then we can access it or see it again in the future. So that way we can either buy or rent it at the exact time we want to. Let's go ahead and just remove it for now and then get into the rest of this. So beneath we have what viewers who have watched this movie or TV show have also watched. So it's kind of a really great way to see similar titles. As you can see, we can just scroll through them 
down here. And if we wanted to, we could actually tap into one to view a similar listing. So as you can see here, we now have the listing for Guardians of the Galaxy. And again, to back out, all we have to do is just press that menu button. And now we're back to the Jurassic World listing. So let's go ahead and swipe down one more level here. And as you can see, if the movie does have iTunes extras, you can preview them. It also gives you some more information on the extras and what's included. And then swiping over even further, we have additional trailers beyond the regular preview that we get at the top there along with the buying and renting options. So let's go ahead and swipe back down. And then from left to right, we have the rating from iTunes users. We do have that common sense score again, 13 and up for Jurassic World. And then we have Rotten Tomatoes reviews here, just swiping all the way over to the right. Below, we do have cast and crew, and we can actually tap into one of them to see additional works from them. So for example, let's go ahead and just tap into this director here, and you can see his additional works. So let's actually go to Chris Pratt, and we will see Guardians of the Galaxy listed there as well. So let's go ahead and back on out using menu again. And finally, at the bottom, we have additional information, the languages it's available in, as well as accessibility details there. So let's go ahead and swipe all the way up, and I'm going to show you guys what happens when we preview it. And I'm going to give you guys a quick example of actually playing content on the fourth generation Apple TV. And it doesn't matter whether you're watching something inside of the movies app, the TV shows app, mirroring content to it from your iOS device or your Mac, just so long as you're not completely sharing your entire screen of your Mac, or even watching something inside of Plex. The actual player it uses for content, as well as the controls are exactly the same across everything. So so let's go ahead and hit play here and this will serve as the video overview portion of this review. So as you can see I have paused it now and we do have a bar that's filling up. The gray piece that's actually going toward the right is what we have buffered so far. We can actually skip to sections that we don't have buffered and then it will start buffering from that point but now that the bar is fully gray it's 100% done with buffering and I found that if you do have at least a semi-decent internet connection you don't really even have to worry about it. I do have 100 megabits per second down, but I'd say anything above maybe 15 megabits per second down and you should be perfectly fine. Even below that though, and you'll just have to let it buffer for a few minutes for a movie or a TV show. Let's go ahead and play it. And in order to do that, we can actually accomplish it one of two ways. We can click in on the trackpad, or you'll notice that we also do have that pause play button. So focusing on the remote here, pause and play will work, or you can actually use the trackpad, clicking in on it will pause as well as play it. And you'll notice that when it is paused, we have the total elapsed time over on the left-hand side. So we've been watching this trailer for seven seconds and we have the time remaining on the right. So when we actually go to play it, you'll notice that it starts to drop down there. We're at two minutes and 14 seconds now. So that's very simple, but what about actually fast forwarding? Well, that's a great question. Let's go ahead and demo that now. All we have to do is just swipe like so, and you'll notice that we're scrubbing along just nicely. And then to play from that point, you actually just have to to press in on the trackpad, or again, you can use play after scrubbing ahead. So let's go ahead and scrub again, and we're going to press on play, and it will pick up from that point. Now, because this is a trailer, and because this isn't an actual movie inside of iTunes movies here, we can't actually get a preview of the specific section we're scrubbing to. I'm going to show you guys what I mean by that in just a second, but let's go over a few other quick things here while we have this up. One thing that I really do like is that we can actually fast forward or rewind by 10 second increments. All we have to do is just rest our finger on the edge. If we want to go forward, we just rest it on the right hand edge. If we want to go backwards on the left hand edge. And you'll notice that actually at that scrub bar there where it shows how long we've been watching it for, we do have fast forward or rewind arrows with 10. All we have to do is then just click in on the touchpad and then it will go forward or backward by 10 second increments. So as you can see, we're at one minute and one second there. And when we press in on again, we're at one minute and 11 seconds. Same thing applies for going backwards. Again, we are now at one minute and one second again, and then we can play it. Now that's how you're going to navigate and control your viewing experience. It's very simple and so much better than actually having to do it on the remote of the previous generation. One other thing that I wanted to mention right now is that you can actually pull down on the touchpad to get additional information here. So let's go ahead and play it. And you'll notice that when we pull down, we have additional info 
info as well as audio controls. So let's go ahead and press menu to return from there and we're just going to pause it. So you may have noticed that when I had the audio controls pulled down there, let's go ahead and re-access it. We actually have some additional control options over the sound. So on the far left, we have the language. If it's a multi-language video, you can select another language, for example, Spanish or English. And then if we swipe on over to the right, we do have this cool option here. We have full dynamic range, which will play the sound in its entirety. Or if you want to reduce loud sounds, you can select that option. It is better for a viewing experience at night, for instance, if you don't want to disturb other people inside of your house. And then scrolling all the way over, we do have speakers. So this controls the output of the Apple TV, where it's actually going to send the audio. So I'm sending it to Bluetooth headphones that I have connected right now, just so that I can monitor it and so that the camera doesn't pick it up. But at the top there, we can send it to the Apple TV, which will then just send it to whatever it's connected to over HDMI, in this case, just my 4K TV, or beneath it, it also says Apple TV. You may be wondering, well, why does it say that? That's because this is what we actually have networked. So if we wanted to, we could send the sound over AirPlay to the other Apple TV that I do have connected to the network or any other device that you have networked. For example, if you do have an Apple Airport Express that acts as a receiver, then you can send it that way and you can actually get some really cool speaker setups going on. And that's everything for audio. Over on the left, we don't have anything just because this is a trailer, but sometimes based on what you're watching, this will be populated. So let's go ahead and go back now because that's absolutely everything I want to discuss as far as actually playing the video. One other thing though is just that preview that you receive inside of scrubbing when you're watching movies or TV shows. So the best way to demo that is actually to go into Plex here, which is a third party application that you can get from the App Store. We're going to go into that in just a second. First though, I wanted to talk about actually scrubbing. So let's say we wanted to go over and watch this movie right here, San Andreas, and we want to resume it from exactly where we're watching it. Let's just go ahead and resume it using the Plex interface, which is oddly similar to what we see inside of iTunes movies. We're not going to spend much time talking about the interface here for Plex. We're just going to pause it. And as you can see, immediately when we pause it, we do have a little preview right above the scrub bar. Now, this will apply for movies inside of iTunes movies that you have purchased. The only reason that we didn't see it was simply because we were watching a trailer. So it's a really great way to actually find specific segments inside of the content that you're watching if you want to fast forward or rewind. Again, it does work better just inside of the default movies and TV show apps. So let's go ahead and swipe up here and I'm actually going to talk about a few settings. So launching up the settings application here, it's broken down into a few basic portions. So we have general up at the top. We can then just go into about and we'll get additional information on the Apple TV, such as the tvOS version that it's on right now. We are on 9.0 as well as the serial and the capacity of it. We do have the 64 gigabyte Apple TV right here. And then down below we can select screen savers. Now this is one thing that I really do like. When we do have an iCloud connection, we can actually select specific photos from our iCloud library to actually use as a screen saver. But in this case, we want to use Arial, so we can set it to Arial. And then we have fine controls over how frequently it downloads those Arial wallpapers, and I just have it set to daily. Then beneath that, we have how long until it actually starts playing that wallpaper. So we do have the duration of five minutes there. And last but not least, we have the option of whether it can actually display the wallpaper while music is playing. So if you're listening to tracks for over five minutes without interfacing with the remote, then it will show that wallpaper if it is set to. Let's go ahead and preview it, which is the last option there. Again, it will download new wallpapers on a daily basis and kind of keep them rotated. Right now, there are a finite number of wallpapers, but you should get a good few weeks in there without seeing the same wallpaper twice, or at least hopefully that's kind of the theory here. So let's go ahead and back on out of this screen savers section. We do have a section over how long we want it to actually take to go to sleep. So with this and based on the setting that we had for screensavers, that means it will actually stay active for about five minutes before displaying that aerial screensaver. And then it will have that up for 10 minutes before going to sleep. So that is the total sleep time there. We then just have some accessibility controls, additional information on privacy, restrictions if we wanted to set those. We do have the option of
of whether or not we want Siri actually on. Of course we do. And then we have additional information on Siri and privacy that we can scroll through if you really want to. We also have manage storage. So when we tap into here, we have additional information on the applications and how much storage they're actually taking up. And that's another thing I want to mention really quick. If you ask me right now which one I'd prefer between 32 or 64 gigabytes, I'd definitely say 32. Again, it starts at $149. And right now the applications that you find inside of the app store, as you can see, just from scrolling through here, aren't really too intensive. But as new developers start to come on board and truly access the full potential of the fourth generation Apple TV, and as we start to see more and more intensive applications propagate the app store, that might change and we might see some bigger applications starting to enter the range of gigabytes. So if you plan on downloading intensive applications in the future, you can get 64 gigabytes. Again, that's kind of the future proof model. Or if you want to save some money, you want to go $149. I think you will be perfectly fine with the current selection of apps on the app store. I've hardly used any of the 64 gigabytes that this Apple TV does come with. So let's go ahead and back on out there. We also have the option to set the date and time automatically as well as English and region. Now inside of accounts, you do have control over the Apple ID account that you actually have signed in to your Apple TV. You can also switch back and forth between them in that section. And my personal favorite inside of here, we have a setting that makes it so you never have to enter your password for purchases. It might not be the best if you do live with other people who are using the Apple TV and you don't want them to just put purchases on your account. But for me, it's great to not have to actually enter my password when I want to purchase anything because I can tell you guys it is so annoying to actually have to swipe back and forth constantly and input your Apple ID password that way. Again, it can get very old very fast and right now because there isn't an Apple TV app for iOS, you can't just simply bring up your app and then type in the password that way. Hopefully that will change in the future but as of now that's really the only downfall of the fourth gen Apple TV is just that you have to input all of your passwords manually with the remote and that you can't do it just on your iOS device with a keyboard. And then from there, we also have audio and video. Again, we can control where the audio is actually going. So we have the audio output set to my Bluetooth headphones. The current volume, you can set it here if you want, which is great for the Bluetooth headphones. But if you do have the volume controls set up on your remote for the Apple TV, then that's the best way to control it. Again, we also have some additional information and settings here. We can control the resolution type, as well as whether we want things like navigation clicks, as well as reduce loud sound. So again, just some basic audio and video controls. Below that, we do have the option to enable or disable AirPlay. And if you do have multiple Apple TVs, you can actually set the designation for it here. So because this is a living room, I'm going to set it to living room TV. And then from there on your devices, when you actually go to mirror your content, it will show up as living room Apple TV or whatever you actually have it set for. For example, if you have kitchen, it will come up as kitchen Apple TV and you can set a custom name if you want. And then we just have some additional settings for AirPlay as well as a security option. So you can enable security if you don't want just anyone on your network being able to actually AirPlay mirror their device or the content on it to the Apple TV. Moving along here nicely, we have remotes and devices. So actually tapping into this, this is where you'll be able to connect Bluetooth devices to. So as you can see here inside of Bluetooth, I do have these Parrot Zeke Bluetooth headphones connected. Let me just go ahead and take them off briefly and show you guys. So this is what I'm wearing right now to monitor the sound. And these are actually what are connected to the Apple TV right now over Bluetooth. And as you can see inside of the other device setting, it just has a little spinning pinwheel if it detects a device inside of Bluetooth pairing mode, it will pop up there. And at the very top, you can see we do have our remote as well as its charge level and whether or not it's connected. Obviously it is because we are using it to navigate through this menu here. But as you can see, that's a great way to tell when you actually have to charge the Apple TV remote. And then beneath that, you can actually learn a full fledged TV remote if you wanted to. And then you have some really cool options here under home theater control. You can actually have the Apple TV fourth gen turn on or off your TV over HDMI 1.4. So if you do have even a slightly newer TV, chances are good it will have HDMI 1.4 and it will be able to accept the signal to turn it on or off. You may actually have to go through the settings of your TV to be able to enable this, but as you can see at the bottom, it gives you that support URL to provide additional information on exactly how to do that. And then finally, we have volume controls. So here you can set it up to auto if you want it to automatically connect to the TV or 
where you can set it up for IR, or you can even learn a new device if you want. So for example, let's say you do have a remote, which I happen to have right here, and you want it to learn that actual remote signal, then all you have to do is point it at the actual Apple TV remote and hold down the volume up and then hold down the volume down once it's recognized the volume up signal. And backing out here, of course, at the very top, we do have the option to enable the touch sensitivity of the trackpad of the regular remote. From there, we just have some application settings. There's really nothing in here that's too in depth, so I'm not going to get into it. Of course, we also have network, we have some system details, and we can set it to sleep right now if we wanted to. Another way to set it to sleep though, and if your TV actually supports that HDMI 1.4 control, it will set the TV to sleep too, or it will turn it off rather, is to actually hold down this button here. So let me bring this into view, and you'll notice that when we hold this button down, this is just the main button to actually return to the home screen on the Apple TV, it will prompt us to enter sleep mode on the TV. So let's go ahead and back out and then hold it down again. And as you can see, we do have the option to set it to sleep. I'm just going to cancel it though. And one other cool thing that's pretty similar, if you wanted to automatically enter your wallpaper or your screensaver, is to just double press on menu at the home screen. So as you can see, quickly pressing on it there, we'll enter that aerial screensaver mode. So let's go ahead and exit out just by pressing any button there to return to this screen. So as you can see, now we're starting to get a great feel for the Apple TV and most of the applications as well as the watching experience is identical to what I've stated up until this point. So now let's go ahead and get into the App Store, which is really the true feature of this fourth gen Apple TV. Up until now, the Apple TV has not had the App Store. Again, it's very similar and at the top, you'll notice we do have that top menu section where we can navigate through the top charts as well as categories, what we've actually purchased or what we've downloaded on this Apple TV here or any Apple TV that you've had for that matter, and then as well as search. And as I stated before, because we do not have that iOS remote application, we have to actually manually search for things this way just by swiping through the letters with the touchpad. So if we wanted to look for Plex, for example, we just have to type it in like so. And let's actually go ahead and open it up so that way we can see the app listing, which again is also pretty similar to what we saw inside of the iTunes movies section. So as you can see, it just states the name at the top. We do have a synopsis here, additional information on the application that we can tap into to learn more about it. And then if you don't have it downloaded or purchased, if it is a paid application, it will prompt you to download it here or to purchase it. But because we do have it downloaded and because we are viewing that listing, just like on iOS, you have the option to open it. And when you tap on that, it will just open that application. So I'm actually going to go back here and you'll notice that when pressing the menu button, it won't go back to the app store. What we have to do is go to it one of two ways. We can either press the main return to home screen button here, or we can double press it and it will enter this multitasking interface. And then we can just go back to the app store. So let's go ahead and do that quickly down beneath that section. We do have the option to view some screenshots if we wanted to, and we can simply swipe between them. It's a little interesting. Swiping here kind of seems backwards. You have to go over to the left to actually swipe right to the next one. It seems a little bit weird right now. Hopefully that will be changed in the future. And then beneath that, we have the option to rate it. So let's just go ahead and rate it five stars there. And it will automatically send that rating. You can see it says thanks. It gives you ratings for the current version. As you can see, 4.5 out of five stars. And then it gives you the breakdown to the right of that, as well as the rating for all versions. And then finally below that, it gives you some additional information as well as top in-app purchases. And you can even see the version history if you wanted to. So you can kind of track the changes because applications will actually automatically update here on the Apple TV. So let's go ahead and exit out. And I'm just going to go inside of one more app in the top charts just to show you guys so you can get a feel for it. So let's go to Rayman Adventures here. And you'll notice that we do have a different background as well as kind of a different vibe. So I really do like that. It is maintained throughout all applications pretty much kind of that frosted and glossy feel that is dynamic based on kind of what's in the background. So let's go to one other application here. Just while I thought of it, I wanted to show you guys what happens if you go to an app that you don't have installed. So if it is for free, it just has that get arrow. But if it is a paid application, so let's go up to the top here, top paid apps, it will prompt you to purchase it. So that's pretty much the app store. Very simple, very basic. You can find what you're looking for super fast. And it's really great because you're not stuck with a ton of applications that you don't need. If you want an application,
application, you can get it through the app store. That's what I absolutely hated about the old Apple TV, the second generation, as well as the third generation. You were just cram packed with apps. And if you didn't want them, well, too bad. You couldn't really easily get rid of them. You could hide them, but you couldn't fully uninstall them either. Now the only default applications are what you see here at the top. Let's actually go ahead and move ocean horn down. And I'm just going to show you guys all of the applications that are installed by default. So you just have the movies, app store, music, photos, TV shows, as well as settings, computers, and then search. So this is everything that you get when you actually get the Apple TV fourth gen. Everything else you have to download yourself. And if you want to remove an app, very simple. You can do it inside of settings, manage storage, how I told you guys about, or as you can see, we do have a prompt here to delete it just by pushing pause play. We have a confirmation there, and then we can hit remove to the prompt for game center. And as you can see, it is fully gone. So it's that easy to manage the applications that you have on your Apple TV. Currently, we do not have folder support. However, chances are good we are going to get that in the future. Developers have already found code four folders on the fourth gen Apple TV. Now, before we start to wrap up this video here, let's get into Siri and how Siri actually functions. So as I mentioned before, all you have to do is just hold down the Siri button, speak whatever you wanna ask Siri or tell Siri to do, and then release it, and then it will automatically process your request. So let's go ahead and try that now. Show me Star Trek. And as you can see, we do have a very awesome interface there when you're actually interacting with Siri, definitely inspired by the Apple Watch as well as iOS 9. And then when you actually release it, it processes it. As you can see, I asked it to show me Star Trek. It comes back with all of the titles that are related or the titles that have the same name in this case here. So we have Star Trek and then we can press in on it and it will take us to that specific listing. Of course, if we didn't wanna to go to that listing, we could just swipe all the way down to dismiss it and that's it. So it's very simple and non-intrusive. Let's actually try to search for a TV show this time. Show me Game of Thrones. Because there was only one match for it, it just brought us straight to Game of Thrones. And then from here, this is actually the exact same thing as Search, which I showed you guys there as one of the default applications. It's a unified search, so it will search across multiple apps. We can actually view it in HBO Now, and it also tells us the season. So for example, if we search for something on Netflix, such as Daredevil, it would say available on Netflix one season. So when we go to tap on it, if we don't have it downloaded, it will prompt us to download the HBO Now app from the app store and then we can actually view game of thrones that way if we have an hbo subscription again the same thing applies for content found inside of other applications big name ones such as netflix as well as hbo and showtime but siri can actually do a lot more than just that so let's go ahead and try this again let's ask for weather what's the weather like in los angeles it says it's currently 79 degrees in LA and that the weather's looking good. We can also swipe up here on this specific bottom menu to actually bring us into additional information on weather. Now we can use Siri to also do things such as check a specific stock, how it's doing for that day, or in this case, because it's the weekend, how it actually did on closing on Friday. And we can also ask for sports scores if we wanted to. And one other super cool thing that you can do is actually inside of the movies app. I'm not going to demo it now just because we're we're on a trailer, but you can bring up Siri just like this and you can say, what did they say? And then Siri will automatically rewind it and then turn on captions for a brief time and then turn them off after that section has passed. So that way, if you happen to miss something and you're watching a movie inside of iTunes, for example, you can pick up on exactly what they said. And finally for this review, one thing that I wanted to get into was AirPlay mirroring. So on an iOS device here, all you have to do is just bring up Control Center and then tap on AirPlay and then just select it. So as you can see, we do have the the living room Apple TV. We're not going to fully mirror it. We're just instead going to mirror the actual content that we have when it detects content. So now we're actually going to go inside of Safari and we're going to play this video here and it will AirPlay mirror it to the TV. It is fully buffered already and it is playing. We can swipe through it just like so, like we could previously inside of the movies application or inside of Plex. And actually this would probably have been better to show you guys the script 
scrubbing preview here because we do get an awesome preview for it. It is fully buffered, and as you can see, here we go. So we can kind of get a preview of what we're actually going to see in advance, and then if we wanted to jump to that section, we can just click in on it. Like I said before, the exact same thing does apply for AirPlay mirroring, just so long as you're not mirroring your entire display to your Apple TV, obviously, because when you do it that way, it's not mirroring that specific content. So guys, that wraps up this video. Again, AirPlay mirroring is great. Really the only downside of the Apple TV right now is the fact that we do not have the remote app for iOS and we can't easily input our passwords. But that's an oversight that can easily be overlooked, especially since chances are good we are going to get a new application in the future. I'm betting Apple is actually completely reworking the remote app and they're going to introduce a new one solely for the fourth generation Apple TV. It's a great time to get into the platform right now for only $149. I haven't looked back at all and chances are good you won't either. I'm sure you'll absolutely love it and with the App Store it makes it so much better. With the ability to download things like Plex, it opens up an entirely new world for the Apple TV as well as media consumption. We're no longer just limited to what we have inside of iTunes as well as what we can actually AirPlay mirror from our other devices. The Apple TV is getting so much better and it's continuing to all the time. Again, as I mentioned before, we do have software updates that are pushed to the device and previously inside of the App Store application, we actually didn't even have a top chart section and we didn't have a categories section. Well, without actually having to update at all yourself, Apple was able to push these updates to the Apple TV, to the App Store specific section, so now it has those new options for it. And if you guys want a chance to win a brand new fourth gen Apple TV of your own, all you have to do is just navigate to freeappsfast.com and sign up. Once you do download one or more of the sponsored applications, just so long as you do earn points, and then you can go to the fourth tab at the bottom and you see that referral link, I want you guys to take the unique part so it appears after the equals symbol and post it in the comment section of the video I have linked for you guys on your screens now, just my unboxing of the fourth gen Apple TV. It's really simple and then you'll be automatically entered to win one. Again, let me know your thoughts on this review down below in the comment section. I'd love to hear whether you guys liked it or found it useful. And if you guys want to be updated more often, such as when I release new videos similar to this one or even videos covering things like jailbreaking, just be sure to like me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter. Of course, click the subscribe button down below next to my channel name if you have yet to. And until next time, this is ICU signing out.